Today, we're going to review three factors that lead to underarousal in the brain, as well as four main regions of the brain implicated in ADHD, and what practically this looks like. Finally, we will look at the role of neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and dopamine, and their roles in the symptoms of ADHD. The irony of attention disorders is that as the criteria spells out, you have hyperactive behaviors, excessive talking, excessive movement, struggle with focus, and then many with ADHD take a stimulant. It seems counterintuitive or it doesn't make sense until you realize that the ADHD brain experiences under arousal. There are three factors that lead to this under arousal. There is decreased glucose metabolism in the frontal premortar cortex and the superior prefrontal cortex, as well as in the basal ganglia and the thalamus. This is why people with ADHD do not maintain focused attention for long. The second factor is sluggish communication. Back in the mid-90s, Linus and his team discovered that the fully alert frontal cortex fires at a rate of 40 cycles per second. In ADHD, it drops below 40 and leads to real sluggish communication. The third factor is slow blood flow in the superior prefrontal cortex and premortar cortex. Hyperactive and sensation-seeking behavior is the brain's way of making up for irregular sugar metabolism and blood flow. A recent study by Straub et al. looked at the EEG data of 33 adults with ADHD and 35 adults without ADHD to see if the arousal regulation model also applied to adults with ADHD. These adult ADHD patients showed significantly lower arousal levels and significantly less stable brain arousal regulation than controls. And the arousal regulation predicted the retrospectively assessed severity of their childhood ADHD symptoms. But what does this practically look like? The ADHD brain absorbs and retains less than 30% of oral information the first time it comes through listening. This is why it's so important to make sure students are getting complete notes in classes or adding to their notes any information missed. Providing accommodations doesn't provide an unfair advantage, but gives access for students to receive and learn and demonstrate their learning. Otherwise, we don't see a true picture of what they can and have learned. Those supporting clients and living with family members who have ADHD may ask the following questions. Why do they fail to see the big picture? Why can't they keep simple instructions in mind for more than a moment? And why are they so impulsive? These functions are involved in one of the four major parts of the brain implicated in ADHD, the prefrontal cortex or cortices as broken down on this slide. The prefrontal cortex plays a role in emotional regulation, the executive functions of working memory, controlling interference, interrupting inappropriate behavior, timing of behavior, motivational responding, identification of potential rewards, social judgment, and motor control. As you've heard in lifespan development and elsewhere, the prefrontal cortex is the last area to fully mature into adulthood. The prefrontal area is also an important endpoint for long fiber dopamine projections, which is implicated in ADHD. The dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is associated with working memory or the ability to keep plans in mind. The orbital prefrontal cortex is associated with the ability to inhibit inappropriate actions. The anterior cingulate cortex, or ACC, is implicated and related to both emotional control and cognitive control and can lead to the impulsivity of their actions. A recent BBC documentary entitled Living with ADHD, posted on the course site, is an hour-long look at three families whose children have severe ADHD from navigating the impulsive behavior of five-year-old Liam, running dangerously around in the parking lot and bouncing off the sidewalks to impulsively kicking a sibling or a friend and climbing upside down on the couch and hanging like a monkey. The parents are understandably incredibly stressed and have hit crisis points. Viewing even five to ten minutes would give you a better understanding of the severity of the behaviors at times. People also wonder, why can't children with ADHD interrupt their behavior, even when warned, and why do they so often misjudge the consequences of their actions? The basal ganglia are a set of brain structures located beneath the cerebral cortex that receive information from the cortex, transmit it to the motor centers, and return it back to that part of the cerebral cortex that's in charge of motion planning. 
Areas thought to be involved in ADHD are located in the basal ganglia, a part of the brain that controls emotion, voluntary movement, and cognition. And research has previously found that the caudate and the pedamen regions within this ganglia area are smaller in people with ADHD. This is a sagittal view of the brain, and you can see the basal ganglia structures are underneath the corpus callosum. This is a coronal view of the brain. The basal ganglia are found deep within the cerebral hemispheres. The structures generally included in the basal ganglia are the caudate, the pedamen, and the globus pallidus in the cerebrum. The substantia nigra is in the midbrain, and the subthalamic nu nucleus is in the diencephalon. Parents and teachers and others may also ask, why do five minutes seem like an hour to a child with ADHD? Why are so many children uncoordinated or clumsy? And why do children with ADHD fail to learn from mistakes? The cerebellum receives information from the sensory systems, the spinal cord, and other parts of the brain, and then regulates motor movements. The cerebellum coordinates voluntary movements such as posture, balance, coordination, and speech, resulting in smooth and balanced muscular activity. The cerebellum is not just involved in complex overlearned motor movements, but also with a wide array of timing and temporal information processing abilities. What does this look like for adults? It may be restless energy and the passage of time is elusive for those with ADHD. One mother with ADHD shared that she was always continually late for important events for her daughter. And to her daughter, it looked like she didn't care enough to make it to the event or be on time or at times forgot to pick her up as her mom became engrossed in whatever she was doing or got distracted. It also impacts kids and adults in that they don't easily learn from mistakes. If you're continually late, why doesn't one learn from that and start out earlier? The consequential and timing errors can harm advancements at work and in relationships with significant others. On the anterior lobe of the cerebellum is the vermis, which has been shown to be smaller than controls. This has been replicated many times. Some research also indicates smaller corpus callosums. The callosums have anterior abnormalities, which can lead to interhemispheric information transfer as a mechanism in the disorder. Other regions indicated, and probably don't surprise you, are the amygdala, dealing with emotions, the hippocampus, due to involvement with motivation and effort for tasks, and the hypothalamus. Another finding that's been replicated is that total brain volume is also reduced by 5%. The prefrontal cortices, the basal ganglia, cerebellum, and corpus callosum are four main structures of the brain that are impacting one's ability to regulate their behavior in goal-directed ways. It is argued by Dr. Barkley that ADHD is underdiagnosed, and others say that it is by far too overdiagnosed. However, when I would go into the classroom to observe students for an attention disorder and completed behavioral observations as compared to their peers, they were highly discrepant and off task for a majority of the observation. There is a distinct difference between those who have it and those who do not. The second question with the DSM-5 is always how severely it impacts daily functioning, and that is more subjective. This lecture today provides ample evidence that ADHD is a real neurobiological disorder that can severely impact life functioning. It can be inappropriately diagnosed, but if one is given a thorough psychoeducational assessment that looks at behaviors across settings in coordination with one's medical provider and educational psychologist, professionals can help make accurate diagnoses and individuals can cope very well.